This is GuideHouse. We work side by side with our commercial and public sector clients to address their most important challenges by advancing strategic thinking and building trust in society. Our national security segment transforms our nation's greatest emergency management, homeland security, diplomatic, law enforcement, and intelligence community challenges into opportunities. We work side by side with federal agencies to optimize mission operations by defining a vision for the future, a strategy to achieve it, and a plan to measure impact. The future of consulting lives here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Suzanne Wilson Heckenberg, President of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. Welcome back. I certainly enjoyed my time visiting the virtual kiosk this afternoon. I would encourage all of our attendees to take the time to check out the game-changing technology and services that these exhibitors are displaying today. Before we jump into this next session, let me remind everyone that if you are sharing insights on social media, which I certainly hope you are, please use the hashtag Intel Summit 20. Our speakers for this session, entitled The Cleared Workforce in a Post-COVID World, certainly have their work cut out for them. The conversation will examine the urgency of redefining workforce needs, like diversity in recruitment and skill sets, and also the ways in which the entire trusted workforce will accomplish its mission. To kick off this discussion, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nicole Gibson, partner at GuideHouse, who will introduce our moderator. Nicole, over to you. Thanks so much, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. This summit has become the premier forum for the IC to come together to discuss common challenges, gain insights, and share lessons learned so that we can collectively build a stronger, more resilient community. GuideHouse has had the distinct pleasure of partnering with INSA and AFSIA for a number of years. At GuideHouse, we work side by side with our clients to address their most important challenges with innovative solutions that advance conventional th thinking and build trust in society. We are proud to participate and be a sponsor again this year for this first ever virtual summit. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Bob Noonan. Lieutenant General Robert Noonan completed 35 years of military service, serving as the Director of Intelligence, U.S. CENTCOM, Commanding General, U.S. Army INSCOM, and the Department of the Army Deputy Chief of Staff. Bob continued his career as a senior industry executive, retiring in 2017. He's the current chair of the FCA Intelligence Committee and the moderator for this next panel. Please welcome Bob Noonan. So let me start off right away with um, going to you, Johnny, and talk to you about um, where are we, and if you could lay out what the requirement is for the future now, because You've got a lot of lessons learned over there, and they're going to drive a lot of changes. Um, and I know you're, you are DIA, but if you've got some thoughts on the rest of the IC, but what did it, what has this talk to you, uh, told you about how to satisfy your mission requirements during a very, very challenging time with the workforce being dispersed as they are? Um, and you've made a lot of changes. What are the existing challenges you've got? What's been the impact and uh, what do you foresee in the future? So if you'd start us off, I'd appreciate it. All right, thanks Bob, appreciate the uh, introduction and uh, the honor to uh, being here at SCA or SCA uh, Intelligence Summit. Hey, when I look at the um, environment that we're currently operating in, it is something that we as an intelligence agency plan for all the time. Uh, we have to be able to operate in a degraded environment. But one of the things that was different under COVID-19 is that it challenged the assumptions that we had about the nature of our work, okay? So when COVID-19 hit, we had to immediately look at how do we prioritize the, the work that we have to do, those things that can be done within our facilities, okay? What was really critical, what was important that must be done in a classified environment, and then also what could be done outside of our facilities. Now, you know, our networks, uh, unclassified networks. They weren't developed for, to, uh, to handle a uh, robust population working outside. And so that meant that we, were, we would have to also uh, ensure that those networks were capable of taking on a uh, significant uh, uptick in uh, the folks who would be working outside our facility. 
And so we looked at those, those mission sets that we had in terms of the prioritization. We determined what we could do inside. We determined what we could do in an outside environment that would allow us to maintain a level of uh, continuity. And then we, uh, we went about setting up the systems and processes to put in place that would allow us to uh, best meet the balance between the health and safety of our workforce and the mission imperative that we had as an intelligence organization. For those uh, individuals that were working in the facility, uh, they took on the most critical national defense missions. Okay, those things that were the highest priority, China, Russia, uh, North Korea, Iran, and uh, VEOs. For those that were outside of the facility, they looked at the business processes that we had, the things that we could do in a classified environment, such as policy documents, uh, uh, things like uh, the IT systems and maintaining those systems to ensure that they were supporting the rest of the workforce. We also looked at them from the perspective of never waste a good crisis, okay? And so if we, if, uh, we got to uh, have folks outside our facility, how do we improve their skill sets uh, so when they come back into our facilities, they're in a better position than they were before? And so we moved some training down to uh, the unclassified side. We arranged a number of seminars out there. We improved our language skills, our understanding of regional issues. We improved our ability to look at the uh, uh, implementation of the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. We looked at how we could accelerate uh, the, uh, the creation of data scientists uh, within the agency so that they can meet the, our mission requirements. We also looked at those uh, mission imperatives uh, that were uh, possible to be done uh, more efficiently and effectively in an unclassified environment. For example, Mars. Mars is our number one priority. It's the machine-assisted rapid repository uh, system. Basically, it is a, the foundational military intelligence that allows us to understand and operate an environment and the forces that are within it. It is the future of how we're going to understand fighting in that environment. Uh, in this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, we were able to move uh, our uh, digital services down to that unclassified environment and improve our ability to deliver the capabilities of Mars uh, much sooner than we would have been in the classified environment, simply because we had the ability to have more people work. All right, so a number of lessons learned about people. All right. There are policies that we have to adjust. Uh, to ensure that our folk uh, are able to better accomplish their work in a distributed uh, environment. So it's, uh, as we look to the future, we, we understand the lessons uh, uh, from this uh, COVID emergency and that we're going to have to look at all of the networks that are out there and operate on. We're going to have to operate from different locations, some of them classified, some of them unclassified. We're going to have to look at skip locations wherever they may be and use those to increase the robustness of our, our of our networks. Okay. We got to rely on our partners. Okay. We have to rely on industry to help us uh, you know, doing normal business activity, doing a contingency, doing a crisis. What, what we learned is something we already do. And that is that we must have strong relationships, strong partnerships with industry. We learned that they have to, that the industry needs to uh, help us understand the art of the possible, the cutting edge of technology out there, and provide the expertise that was going to allow us to maintain our qualitative edge. <clears throat> Overall, I think that the COVID-19 uh, environment uh, has taught us that things that uh, we Envision would happen and operate in a degraded environment are in fact the things that we need to concentrate on, but we have to do it a lot faster uh, than we were doing in the past. So we've got to, uh, to make that transformation. We've got to pivot much sooner. About yeah, great, John. That's the perfect way to kind of kick this thing off. Great rundown of what y'all been doing. Chris, you've been writing uh, and speaking on it in bits and meetings, and I've also read some of your articles uh, on especially things like on, on the uh, skip, um, I'm sorry, on, on teleworking. 
And which how, you you know you're a chief operating officer of one of the the partners in for the IC. How do you see this teleworking? How is it impacting the workforce? Uh, what's the good and the bad of it? And then and then if you have a little more time afterwards, how about talking about how you're extending these communications networks? Your thoughts on that to make this job easier? Because I I think all of us agree that we're probably going to see something like the pandemic again over the next. I don't think we're going to have to wait another 100 years like we did with this one, but, uh, you know, what's what's going to be next? So just your thoughts on teleworking and extending the networks. Sure. Uh, thanks, Bob, and uh, thanks to AFSIA and INSA uh, for hosting this event. And uh, I'm excited to, to speak on the topic. It's a very important topic. I also really appreciate what Johnny was just saying. We didn't um, completely coordinate our comments, but... A lot of what Johnny was saying on the uh, government side will play into some of the topics that I'll be talking about uh, today. I I'm going to break it down, Bob, into sort of how we responded, how we're operating, and then really focus on what we need to do in the future. So first, uh, the, the the first part is you know how we responded. Uh, I, again, the question most people ask is when are we going to get back to normal? And part of our response, I think, has taught us that we have to move forward better. Um, our operations have taught, taught us that. And uh, as a community, we've done that really well in the past. So first, again, on, on response. We uh, quickly, in industry and many other companies, adopted a telework remote environment. Our company has about seven offices. They remained open, open but we quickly shifted to full remote operations. Most of our network operations are, are unclassified, so it was really a matter of uh, could the network handle the volume. So that very first weekend, uh, we had half our, our workforce test the network, and by Tuesday, our, company, our entire company was, was uh, working remotely. We quickly started adopting, adopting some tel uh, technologies like WebEx, Microsoft Teams to conduct meetings. We immediately launched a task force, again, like my, many agencies and many other companies. The initial focus was, just like you said, Bob, communication and then the health and welfare of our employees and letting them know what was going on and what we were going to do. Uh, our, our task force kind of converted to a workplace readiness. As we started to, to plan for the workforce coming back, the PPE, uh, uh, you know, face coverings, all the protocol that we needed to uh, sort of facilitate to make sure folks can come back to work sa safely. But what we found out was the remote effort was going so well, we were able to reduce the need to you know, bring folks back. And, uh, uh, and so we really wanted to focus on, uh, on how we were gonna operate, maybe for the long term um, from a telework standpoint. Now, granted, a lot of industry has SCIF facilities within their organization. So that was a different different setup. Um, the people that were working in the SCIF, we had to have an immediate plan. And what we did is we created uh, three shifts uh, to make sure there was proper spacing and applying proper mask policies to make sure we can continue to maintain operations uh, within our SCIFs. So that has been ongoing from the very start. We then were seeing that the CARES Act came out, particularly Section 3610, as it related to the cleared workforce. Now, it started out slow, but it quickly materialized. And there are countless of, of contracts officers, CORs, COTRs that worked uh, incredibly long hours to get industry and government um, to hash out the details of 3610. And I will say their willingness and the flexibility, it's always great to see this community come together in a crisis. And that was certainly the case here. And so that operation got up and going. Some of our folks were essential and they were going into the building. Uh, some of the folks uh, were working in shifts and then we, some of them imposed that full 3610 policy of, of working remotely uh, through the process. And in some cases were able to take, you know, some training and, and, and things like that. The interesting thing is when, when the CARES Act first came out, um, it said this will be um, a, an act that covers a period through 30 September. And back in March, we were like, whoa, that's plenty of time. You know, we were, we were listening to 15 days to flatten the curve. And so we looked at September as a very long time away where we would have 
a lot of this under control. We've learned a lot in the last six months, and we've learned uh, it's September 16th, and now we're coming up to that deadline, and we're looking at the, the sort of the next wave or the next element of this. So that was how we responded initially. So from the response, we turned to operations. And that's, again, what we've been focusing on the last six months. We took that opportunity to try to innovate. Again, along with many of our business partners, um, we looked at innovative ways to make sure we continue to meet mission needs. And I got to give credit to AFSIA and to INSA. They pivoted to the virtual environment extremely fast. And in some cases, and in many cases, I would say, we were able to hear from our agency representatives virtually and a lot more often than we had prior to all this. So in some cases, it actually improved communications. INSA established a, a working group. I'm part of that working group. And we were regularly meeting with the deputy directors of the big agencies. And what was really great about that, it was a back and forth. They were telling us what they were doing. We were saying what, what we were doing. And they talked through the phases of their sort of reconstitution. And today, some agencies are at 90% capacity. Some agencies are at 75% capacity in terms of having people in the building. And they could pivot back and forth to phases as the situation dictates. So that's the first two elements of respond and then, and then continue to operate. Now, the last piece is, for me, is one of the most important pieces, and that's, you know, where do we go from here? Um, I'll outline a couple ideas and a couple things that I think we should look in down to the detail, not excruciating detail, but detail of kind of technologies and environments that I think we should really focus on. Um, the first is real estate. Real estate in the D.C. metropolitan area is going to change, I believe, for, forever in, in, in regards to our industry. Remote work is not an option, it's a necessity. We never really fully embraced remote work in the past, especially in our community. We took some baby steps, but now there's an opportunity to really, really focus on this. This will allow us to save real estate costs and that helps both the government and industry. It'll also allow us to entice employees um, that are geographically dispersed who in the past, we had a challenge to recruit because maybe they didn't want to or couldn't afford to live in the DC metropolitan area. And, and if you can work remote, you really remove uh, that barrier. Now, granted, it's trickier dealing with classified work. Uh, there is a lot though that we can do at the unclassified level with greater efficiency. For many industry elements, you know, we have human resources, contracts, security. Many of those entities are operating in an unclassified environment. And they can continue to support um, the, the IC and the military in an unclassified environment. So um, I think this really creates an opportunity in how we maintain telework. So telework option continues post COVID and also positions us for, for the next crisis. So telework is the first one. The second one is connectivity. The Army roughly has 800,000 employees who are teleworking and has plans to provide access to 2,000 remote classified users. Now, they already had plans to do this, but they had to accelerate those. And this crisis um, expedited those plans and they're moving out on that. Um, I think, honestly, we must advance our abilities to accomplish similar activities within the IC. Again, there are security challenges in all of this, but as I said before, it's safe to assume there's no better time than to resolve some of these challenges. Again, we need to prepare for the next crisis as we are sort of in the middle of this crisis. And then the final thing that I think we can do, um, industry can help with SCIFs. I mentioned we have SCIFs. Um, Judy, I think uh, your organization has SCIFs. There are many companies that have SCIFs. Uh, I think the area of focus here is on developing a broader co-use accreditation. Much like badge reciprocity, the time has come to consider mutual agreements with regard to SCIFs um, that'll allow a little bit more flexibility and an ability to work off uh, premise with, uh, with greater latitude. The physical, the physical requirements are very similar, but the uh, accreditation varies from agency to agency. And so as a company, if we have a SCIF and we could stay separated 
from you know uh, congregating in one building, that gives us more advantages and options. And we could also help our small business partners by providing that element for them as well if they don't have uh, those kind of facility capabilities. We're, we're basically looking for a way to be uh, efficient and, and consider options that we maybe didn't consider before, but also maintain uh, integrity. And then finally, Bob, uh, I'll give, give uh, Judy and Mark a chance to, to talk about this as well, but I did wanna make the point, um, there are costs for all of this, but there's also cost savings as well. Uh, increased ability to telework allows for uh, lower real estate expenses, as I've said. Um, it gives us a chance to recruit both in government and industry, um, where with you not having to physically be there, uh, to have the parking facilities, to have the infrastructure, the office requirements, if you can still maintain those operations. And it also gives us an idea to relook at the classification levels of the things that we may be sharing and not ensuring we're not over classifying information um, so we have we can have access and, and, and not have to worry about that element as well. Finally, we are in the early stages of an evolution and, and many of us were around for 9-11 and what we changed in our community as a result with regard to sharing. I think this crisis is unfortunate and as Admiral Sharp stated you know, this morning, we don't wanna just survive it. We, we wanna be better. We wanna have a, an opportunity now to look at how we re revolutionize the way we do work. And again, move forward better to ensure we're better positioned as this one winds down and other similar activities uh, come to the forefront. Okay. That's why we picked you to be on the panel, Chris. <laughs> Great job. Um, Judy. Uh, your thoughts on how industries reacted and kind of saying we've done this, where are we headed in the future? And if you could, uh, one of the things that came out this morning was everybody talked about people are going to determine whether we make it or break it on this whole thing. And it's the quality of our people. So if you, as you comment on this, could you also talk about talent management and, and what you're doing to help lead? And what we should do as a community maybe to retain these guys better or are there some thoughts you have around that and uh, you know one thing I've always thought is we ought to do a lot better job of sending people into the government out of the government in and out and all that to share ideas but I'll lay that off to you so your thoughts Judy well just to react to that you know experiences matter so how could that hurt to share you know perspectives like that um, the thing I love about a conference like this, Bob, is you know you get to hear what's on people's minds and from your den potentially this time. Um, and what is really encouraging about what I'm hearing as I listen to the sessions is we are of like mind, and that isn't always the case. Um, you know when when I come to a conference like this, but embracing flexibility is a theme that I'm hearing. Um, make maximizing the effectiveness of telework. There's a lot of complications around that as we move out, but it really seems like we have normed around something here that um, can give us a lot of lift. So let, let me start by talking about my, our initial reaction to the CARES legislation. Um, for a company like Booz Allen, where the majority of the work that we do is focused on delivering talented people and outcomes, 3610 was exactly what we needed to support our trusted workforce. Um, the legislation has been key to retaining people. And just as an aside, we did see back in the spring an increase in targeted recruiting. And had it not been for the certainty that 3610 brought to those people, um, I'm convinced we would have lost some assets. So that was a big lift for us. Um, also with the support of teleworking, and social distancing, we clearly protected our workforce. And those two points allowed our people to really focus on delivering the mission, which is real, which is what it was all about. So we are incredibly grateful for the, for the CARES Act. We think it gave us the lift that we needed to launch into COVID and to get through it. And we talked a little bit about the flexibility that it offered in terms of where we can deliver and looking at security classifications carefully. I think the fact that we as, at scale, looked at decoupling what's classified and what's not classified and opened up the aperture into um, the unclassified work that we're doing is a breakthrough. 
I think there's so much talent out there that doesn't just live, you know, in, in Maryland or in D.C. or in, in Virginia. It's across the, across the country. And I think we can tap into that. And that that is a huge talent breakthrough and necessary for not just national security, but businesses across the country. And then not, not to mention, as we move into that unclass world, um, cutting around administrative costs and and savings there that can be applied to the mission. I think it, it's it's great for us. And then, of course, we learned that there are some missions where the only place to perform the work is in the SCIF. We knew that, right? And as Chris mentioned, we did our best to implement social distancing, and but we learned some things along the way, and we have some work to do to ensure mission continuity, and we're, and we're doing that work. Um, I think the points that Chris raised about additional SCIF space or having distributed SCIF architectures or classified architectures that are connected and that are shared and that are co-used. I don't think we want every individual project team building their own infrastructure. We need to think about how we can how we can share that. So overall, I would I would say Keras has been great for our community. Uh, we needed it and and we're, we're building on it. And in terms of the people, I don't know if I can find anybody who's gone through 2020 that isn't a little stressed about something. <laughs> I mean, wave after wave, right? COVID first, facing into social injustice second, the political environment, hurricanes, fires, kind of, it, it just keeps coming. And then on top of that, people are dealing with that while they are at home, many of them serving as a parent, a teacher, and a worker all at the same time. So it's it's a tough situation for for the people in our business. Um, but I heard an interesting statistic provided by our security team this week, and that is that while nationwide statistics show emotional health issues have increased significantly during this period of isolation, up to 30 um, percent, the employee assistance hotline and security concern reporting has decreased. And that, that's this is on nation, a nationwide level. So think about those two things and that it's not intuitive and it gives, gives us a little pause. And it could mean that the industry has some blind spots due to less in-person interaction between the coworkers and first line supervisors. And so in this new normal, we need to find ways to see each other, whatever see each other means, right? To spend time with each other, to check in with each other. So at, at Booz Allen, some of the things that we're doing is we're working to close the gap through what we're calling meaningful engagements, um, really to fill the void. And so examples are our CEO, Horacio, is leading the way with some fire, fireside chats. And he started way back in March and has made himself available for small groups of people to have conversations and to share what's on their mind. Um, and those. From those chats, we've learned a lot of really good information. I'll describe some of the results in a minute, but um, we've had be heard listening sessions, town halls, exercise challenges. I suspect those on the call, Chris and, and others, can talk about some of the things that they've been doing. But I think that those in-person connections are super important for us to continue to do so that we're checking in with people. And there, there are really three main takeaways that I'll share with you from these sessions. The first is that overwhelmingly, the view is that across the national security market, the government leadership has absolutely respected the entire workforce. Whether it's a government employee or an industry partner, it's one team in terms of safety, health, and protection. And that is really awesome. Um, the second is that the 2020 stressors, I'll call them, have really caused our employees to need more from our employee support programs. And so we have amped, amped up our programs. We've expanded our employee assistance program to offer more options around childcare support, personalized coaching, financial advice, and tutoring resources. So things that weren't as important before have come to the, to really jumped out, right? We've continued to focus on uh, professional development to make sure that we're maintaining the force and the readiness um, we've added additional PTO programs. We heard loud and clear that time was needed. I mean, we're not really going anywhere, but sometimes we need to not focus on work. So we have ways where you can buy more PTO or you could donate to others. 
Um, we've launched a review of our processes and our systems to uh, identify and eliminate bias and inequity. And that's that's going to be a, a process that we will follow with our uh, assessment that we will um, work on through the year. And then we've also, as everybody's talked about, focused on flexible schedules. So the, the final thing I'll say is that through these sessions, you know, while everybody is committed to the mission and people are grateful to have the opportunity to continue to work through this crisis and continue to um, make their mark, there is concern going into the fall. And it's around the full recon reconstitution of the workforce and what could happen with the COVID flare up. Um, uncertainty around cares and what's going to happen there. The political environment, schools, are schools going to be open? Are they going to be closed? Am I a teacher? Am I not? And then just generally cold weather, driving people inside when outside was kind of the place you could go to get away. So that's that's what's on the hearts and minds of, of our people and um, some of the responses that we're putting in place. Great, Judy. So, you know, so Mark, over to you. Um, you spend a lot of time, you spend every day, probably not as much now since your new elevated role as the uh, new provost over at George Mason, but um, with the, the next generation of people that are going to be in the intel community and are going to be in government service, um, what are these kids like? Uh, we watch TV at night and, and uh, we can get pessimistic or optimistic, uh, but you're down there with them. What are they thinking about? What do they What do they want to do? What What's on their mind? Yeah, well, first, first I'm virtually terribly optimistic. That's not the right thing to say terribly, but I'm positively <laughs> optimistic maybe uh, because what I see every day are are young people and George Mason University is a unique kind of university, by the way, we're the largest comprehensive research university in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have over 38,000 students and we're a minority majority university today with all of our undergraduate students. Having said that, we also have a broad range of students, many of whom are in the 22 to, or 18 to 22, 23 range that are sort of traditional, but many other students who are returning to school to return to the workforce. And, and as I began to say, Bob, I'm, I'm positively optimistic. Our, our students are engaged, they're inquisitive, they're creative, but most of all, I think, most of all, they, they, they wanna solve problems and they see the problems of today as being complex, they see them as being intriguing, they see them as requiring creativity, and they see them as requiring solutions that are very different today from the solutions of the past. The grand challenges of today require that we look at problems from a multidisciplinary perspective, from a range of perspectives, not a linear perspective. And, and so as I look at our student population, whether it's an 18-year-old coming to college for the first time, whether it's a 45-year-old returning to college to change careers, they're engaged, inquisitive, creative, but most of all, and this is what I want to emphasize, they want to make a difference. They want to make a difference so the world is a better place. And, and Lord knows today there are many challenges that we face. And, and so I think as I look at our student population, they want to learn about a variety of different things. They want to participate in a range of activities, both traditional and atraditional, and they value relationships with each other, with their professors and faculty, and they are very, um, I want to use the word entrepreneurial, but I'd rather use the word ambitious. They're ambitious because they understand the complexities of today are more complex than ever before, and that's going to require an engaged, inspired, well-trained, enthusiastic, and inquisitive workforce of tomorrow, and, and that's what we're trying to train at George Mason. That's, that's exactly what we're trying to do, is not to have kids or young people or even older people come into our classrooms to, to simply listen. We're asking them to come into our classrooms and to engage, to make a commitment to be part of the solutions of the complex problems of today. And, and for me, that's, uh, that's really inspiring to be around on a daily basis. Yeah, that's great. It's great. That's encouraging. Positively encouraging. Positively encouraging. Positively. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, let me address a couple of questions from the audience, and, uh, and then we'll get back to some other ones here. So, um, Johnny, you you heard this discussion about multi-use and skips. I know I spent uh, my 35 years in the Army, about 20-something inside operational units where we would have a tent or whatever, or a building somewhere. We brought in every agency's input into a skip, and we didn't have, you know, so 
you move to Washington and every company is buying its own skip spaces and they have to be parsed out. There's no co-use uh, unless there's an act of God somewhere. And uh, that just drives costs up. Is there any discussion in the IC right now based on what we've learned with the pandemic on on maybe changing the policy on these? Yeah. So I, I think that the, uh, the policy on SCIFs is up there. So as uh, you are probably aware, uh, the SCIF accreditation mission is being transferred from a DIA uh, to the Defense Security and uh, Counterintelligence uh, Agency. Excuse me. Did I say the right thing? Uh, cooperation, sorry, agency. Right. Uh, DCSA. And so uh, as we transfer those responsibilities, there's, there's of course a, uh, a look at uh, how we implement the rules and the processes within. A couple of things that have been talked about um, uh, to date is uh, having the services uh, do accreditation of their skills. Uh, so as opposed to having you know a central uh, team that comes out from uh, DIA or DCSA to ensure that the, the, the services who are already doing a lot of the work have the authority to do accreditations of their skills as well. Now, uh, you spoke earlier, or the, uh, the team spoke earlier, uh, about the, the need for uh, cross-accreditation. Personally, I think that's absolutely correct, that, that we've got to have an ability to have cross-accreditation uh, of SCIFs. I think that we have to have an ability to leverage SCIFs as a network, okay? So as it currently exists, we each own our individual uh, facilities and uh, we work within the confines or the constraints of those facilities. When we could leverage the capabilities that we have, uh, you know, across the country, both inside the government and in the corporate industry, to uh, better meet the uh, mission requirements. So, a condition uh, uh, or an environment such as that we're in with uh, COVID-19, you know, just imagine if we had an ability to uh, move employees, regardless of whether they were government or contractors, into those facilities that were best able to accommodate them to meet new mission requirements. Now, I can't tell you that that has happened and that it's going to happen uh, as we uh, look at the SCIFS policy. But what I can tell you is that uh, this environment is driving new ways of thinking. And it's been mentioned earlier that uh, the, the way we do things tomorrow is fundamentally changed. And for, you know, uh, whatever we thought we were going to do yesterday, eh, it is going to be different. And, and, and in that difference, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities for us to make changes that are going to uh, significantly improve our capability. Uh, I talked about partnerships, uh, that those are important. And it's those partnerships that are going to allow us to get to uh, the necessary agreements uh, for us to have uh, you know, the, this distributed uh, SCIF network. Uh, I would lastly um, um, mention uh, policies. Policies have got to change. They got to be uh, 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 more simple, okay, easier to implement, and reciprocal. Uh, reciprocal uh, in terms of uh, if I accredit it, then it's accredit my accreditation should be of value, a benefit to you, uh, and that goes not only for the SCIF itself, but as we're looking at the capabilities that are present within the SCIF. If one agency does it, it should be good enough for the next agency to use. Yeah. That makes way too much sense. Right. So, uh, we're encouraged to hear that. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, how about, uh, and I'll just throw this out. So, we, you had to institute a lot of practices based on, you know, dispersed workforce, the whole teleworking. What's going to stay? What's the line? And you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but what do you think is going to endure out of this whole thing, the changes you've made? Chris talked about real estate costs are going to go, and I personally agree. You know, brick and mortar offices may go away. The idea if you could do skips and even put them outside the, the national capital region, you could have them in different places and move people. But what, what other things do you think are going to endure? Any, any thoughts now that we've, uh, uh, now we've made changes? Some work, some don't. Uh, I think Judy brought up a great point about personal leadership still matters to people, even though they're teleworking and they can look on the screen, but sitting in with your leader and under and make sure that leader understands, I think it's something that's going to endure. But but any thoughts on that or any big changes? Chris or Judy, anything in your companies that are taking a look at, hey, from now on, this is the way we're going to do business? Uh, I, I'll just go first and then throw it over to Judy. I, I think um, first and foremost, uh, protocol on how we deal with an office building 
uh, will change as well. Uh, some of the changes we've made for PPE and and cleanliness and those kind of things, uh, those will stay forever. I mean, that'll help in in beyond just COVID. It helps with you know other uh, things like the flu and things like that. Um, in recent sort of crises, uh, you know, the someone asked a question: What happens after 3610 expires? What are you going to do? Uh, everything prior to this, we've never had a situation where the workforce, for some reason, can't go back into the office. Now, you know, some companies they develop software for the intelligence community, hardware like like we do both, uh, solutions, unclassified solutions, but many of us provide people to the intelligence community. And so this is not a snow day where they can't come in for this day and it's on the company to, to take it on overhead or a presidential uh, you know, election or something that's a day or two event. Uh, even after 9-11, we went home that day and we, you know, most of us came back to the offices uh, understanding the risk, but we, but we reconvened together. This has to change the way we think about that or uh, companies are not going to be able to carry their workforce um, for a long period of time if they cannot continue to uh, work or, or provide, you know, billing to the customer. To be able to do that, they need to be providing value, and uh, they just can't do that by, by not showing up. So I think we have to relook at how industry cleared talent, like government employees in the military, uh, how we can, you know, continue to provide value and not necessarily have to be physically there. I think that's an important element of it. Yeah, I'd add that our overall approach to resource management has already started to change and will continue to evolve. And what I mean by resource management is how we go about staffing jobs. Well, first, how we identify the people in Booz Allen or externally that have the right skills to deliver. And second, how we go about staffing it. We, we used to think about the perfect match as the person who has the right skills, salary fits the contract, is in the right location, and has the right clearances. So two of those four are kind of getting easier for us. And that's a big win in terms of delivering highly talented people to, to jobs. And the two that I mean, of course, are location, and in some cases, as we look carefully at the classification of work, what might have been considered, you know, you need a TS or TSSCI security clearance, maybe you don't for parts of it. So if we can be very thoughtful in how, how we break out that work and define that work, it really opens up the aperture. The other thing I'll say is I'll, I'll share with all of you that I, I don't have any intention of getting in my car and driving to Bethesda for an eight o'clock meeting for one hour anymore. Um, this is working pretty well for us. Our our leadership teams are virtual. Our board meeting was, you know, four hours instead of two and a half days. It's there are some real efficiencies that we have gained by by meeting in this way, and I think that's that's a big plus for us, and that that will continue to change. Yeah, Judy, let me pick up on that point. I think it's a really good one. I was reading an article recently that suggested that we've gone through three phases with the pandemic. The first phase was termed disruption. We were all disrupted by everything that was happening. And the second phase was identified as invention. We had to invent new ways of doing things. We literally invented new technologies. At George Mason, we pivoted in the space of 10 working days over 9,000 courses at the university from being face-to-face -face in our campus to online. 9,000 courses wow. in 10 working days. You need to be inventive. But the next phase, the phase I think we're in now, and the phase that this really smart guy who wrote the article, I, unfortunately I can't remember his name, wrote about, was acceleration. To take the disruption, to embed the inventions, and now to accelerate the learning that we had about how it is we're doing things differently. We're doing the same thing with our board meeting. We used to meet for two and a half days, we're meeting for four hours early in October. We've taken these classes that we have had very expensive buildings. Now we've created very useful, efficient technologies. Uh, we've begun to do things differently. But the point I want to emphasize is that as we've done things differently, we've also realized that there are some things that are a constant. And the things that are a constant, I think, relate to the human relations we have, even though the way in which we relate may be a little different. The need for connection, the need for relationship, 
the need for communication, the need for the workforce to, to maintain a sense of affiliation to task, to be mission-driven but values-led, and one of our new values being how we can continue to do things in an interconnected world in a way where those connections are a little bit different. And I think I think we've learned a lot. I think we're going to continue to learn more. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think the next six months will be maybe even more inventive than the last six months as we think about not how to begin to use some of these technologies, but how we can create some sustainability to the technologies we've only just begun to explore how best to exploit. Yeah, that's great. Get it? Boy, if you could find that article, Mark, send it out. We'll get it out to people. I think uh, that's a... A pretty good summary of what we're, what we're facing. Yeah, it was really insightful. We, um, I just got a, a bit of an update. Tish Long, who's been correcting me for 30-something years, ever since I've known her uh, working. But uh, she says in the FY21 NDAA, um, there is SCIF and uh, special access program reciprocity language for government and contractors. So we'll take a look at that. We can only hope that the agencies will implement it. Uh, once it gets, the language is always pretty good, and then it gets down to the people that have to do it, and it gets amended, whatever that means. Uh, hey, Mark, just a thought on is we're heading to this new 21st century environment. Yeah. Um, uh, General Ashley, the director of DIA, mentioned this morning that, you know, we do a good job in the IC and in, D, in the Department of Defense, the Intel Committee and Department of Defense of, 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 of of our military. We, we can deal with military threats. We understand that. There's four four influencers. How, would, how, how does a country influence its foreign policy in that? It's diplomatic, information, military, and economic. Yes. We don't do a very good job, one man's opinion, on diplomatic information and economic. And, and how do you see how can how can academia help us in those schools? I mean, is and and what are the kids looking at now studying? What what do universities have to offer in that that maybe we haven't leveraged enough in the past? Yeah, I, you know, it's a great question, Bob, and it, it it is really kind of the coin of the realm as we look forward. Uh, I think of how, how to take very complex environments and very complex problems, as I said earlier, and think about solutions that are a traditional solutions that might not have fit. Um, three years ago, let alone 18 months ago, and that might not even fit 18 months from now, but what's going to fit three or four years from now? And, and I, I, I think it's about providing our students who are going to be tomorrow's professionals. And by the way, a great number of students at George Mason go into the intelligence community. We have a program called Clearance Ready, that there are 900 of our students who've been in over the last three years to accelerate the, the clearance process, which is really quite innovative and, and quite important. Uh, undergraduates and graduate students. And I think one of the things that our students are recognizing that the traditional fields that people have gone into the IC for, maybe the security fields, the cyber fields, some of the engineering fields, some of the R&D folks um, are, are, are still very important. But so are other fields in the data sciences as we think about big data in different ways, as we think about analysis using different modalities of, of, of analysis for, for the, the analytics. We think about behavioral sciences. Uh, we think about psychology and sociology and understanding culture, understanding the uniqueness of context. And that's what social scientists have really helped to teach us through the years. It's not just the technologies of what we do, but understanding uh, not, not the soft elements, but the embedded elements, the human elements, uh, the cultural elements, the linguistic elements, the nuances of language. And then we have students who, more and more, I think, and this is just my perception, I don't really have data to back it up, but I, I have a perception that the fastest growing fields, the fastest growing majors at a university like ours are things like global health, uh, international relations, fields that, that provide students with an entry to understand the complexity of problems that aren't just unique to the Americas or the United States but are more global in, 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 in nature. More and more students going into that. I'll tell you an interesting stat I learned recently that we have more students who have already applied for study abroad for the spring semester. Now they may not be able to go, but they've applied for the spring semester than we've ever had before. And I think that's partly a recognition. Let's think about the lesson of COVID. Uh, COVID is not an American problem, although it certainly has been a problem for America. COVID is a global problem, and it's not going to be solved by solving the problem in the United States. It's going to only be solved if we solved it globally. 
And that's what I think students of today are understanding, that we have to think broader than we've ever said before, both in terms of the scope and how we address problems, the depth in which we address problems, and, and, and the style, meaning the, 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 the array of fields of study that you bring to it. So I, I think that's where the future bodes, that we're, we're going to have to continue to expand and explore. And I hope the, uh, the IC will see that, that students from these broad diversity of fields uh, bring great value and add add value to to the fields that the intelligence community have traditionally been um, been harvesting. Well said, Mark. Great, great. I think you're spot on. Hey, uh, Johnny. You know, uh, Judy talked about talent management and training and and and, and all that. Uh, how's DIA dealing with training and and uh, career development in this virtual, unclassified environment? Uh, DIA, you know, has a very robust training program and education program uh, over at the DIAC and other places around around the world, really. So how is that going? That's a so, good question. Yeah, so it is actually going quite well. At the uh, beginning of this COVID crisis, you know, we, we thought that we had to do all of our training uh, inside our facilities and things had to be classified in nature. What we found out is that they don't, okay? that there are a, a number of things that we can do, including uh, uh, programs that were previously uh, uh, done at the level. Take it, for example, uh, analytic training. So analytic training, we, we normally use classified examples done in a classified environment over a number of, of weeks. We were able to uh, change those classified scenarios to unclassified one that allowed us to teach outside of the environment in an unclassified, uh, on an unclassified system. Now think about that once you're able to do it. So that meant we were able to have more students attend the class than we would ever have been able to do physically within our facilities. We were able to get that training out to our partners, uh, who, you know, who before it was quite difficult to get it, uh, you know, a training to them. We had a shared experience globally because rather than just having the few folks that were inside the organization, we've been able to spread it out to our locations with the combatant commands. Uh, and uh, we're, we've also uh, been able to, uh, uh, to have folks that are in our different locations around the country that are able to uh, participate in. So training uh, is uh, been one of those things that uh, has allowed us to improve our capability. Now I talked about analytic training but there's all sorts of training that we've been able to do in an unclassified environment that is, that is improving the skills of our workforce. Uh, we've had uh, uh, virtual seminars with some of the top leaders and uh, thinking about uh, strategic issues, whether in think tanks or in, in academia, uh, where our workforce has been able to participate in those discussions and a, and a large swath that we never have been able to do so prior to the COVID environment operating within our facilities. And so I think that the uh, training is, is one of those things that uh, uh, we have been able to derive great value from, and that it's never gonna go back to the way we had done it before. Uh, we're gonna continue to do it in this environment. We're gonna continue to have opportunities uh, to increase one skill set. And if I could add one last point on that. So I talked about the technology and information trends that were happening before this crisis, and it was just accelerated. You know, we talk about telework. Telework was already coming. It just accelerated the trend for telework. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, those trends are also changing the way that we do work. And that means that we're going to have to uh, reskill, redesign work uh, for, so for our workforce. COVID-19 has given us the opportunity to start to look at those things that we can do now to better position our workforce for the future. And that's in the training environment. So uh, I think that again, great value. Yeah, hey, uh, we've got just about five minutes left. So I'm gonna throw a jump ball out here. Uh, so we're moving off JPAS, we're moving to a new DISS system. How do you, uh, what you, and, and we have this continuing assessment for security clearance. Does anybody want to, how's that working and how's the insider threat thing working during pandemic? And just any thoughts on counterintelligence in industry right now or, or in the government? Um, I, I've got about three or four questions from the audience, so I want to be respectful of those folks. But anybody want to take that on? 
Uh, I'll start. Uh, so at Booz Allen, we have been using a continuous monitoring approach for the last few years. Bob, we talked about this earlier. Um, and we have, it, it, people got people have gotten used to it. It, it, is, it actually turned out to be helpful. You can see early warning signs and, you know, help people, particularly around financial distress. It's, it's turned out to be something that's really good for our organization. Chris, any thoughts? Well, I, I think um, uh, along those lines, I think um, our policies and processes have to change. That's just one element of them that will have to change. Uh, I do know that, um, you know, it, it's not just in that in that realm. It's in the realm of how you also protect uh, a network now, especially if you're an industry that is fully re remote using protocol. Um, to ensure while people are working from home, they're still working on private networks, encrypted networks to maintain the integrity of, da of data. So you, in one sense, I'm pushing for innovation, but also emphasizing the need to maintain awareness and vigilance because people don't have that same sort of mindset when they're working from, uh, you know, their office in their home uh, compared to working in a, in a, um, uh, industry building or a government building. And so we, one thing is we can't let our guard down when it comes to protocol. Yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of challenges here. Okay. We've got, uh, two minutes left. Uh, Mark is positively optimistic. Uh, I'll go around Johnny, Chris, Judy, how do you see this movie ending? Is it going to be a good news story after a long, long tumultuous fight? Uh, how do you see this this going here, Johnny? So for uh, the the future of uh, a work for a cleared workforce, I think it is already a success story. And as I look at uh, uh, the future for this agency and how we're going to have to uh, operate in a distributed nature and in degraded environments whether it's for coop planning or if, if we're involved in a contingency, this crisis has given us the opportunity to better position ourselves to operate in that environment. I think we're better for it. I think we're going to be a, a much stronger agency. Uh, and I think, uh, again, when I talk about that partnerships, I think those partnerships are going to be stronger between uh, the government, industry, and academia. Great. Chris, 30 seconds. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm also positive too. <laughs> I mean, the intelligence community is a people business, and uh, people are coming together to face this crisis. And in in in, in any typical crisis, it force it's a forcing factor to focus on things. We've talked about skills. We've talked about unclassifying work. We've talked about um, teleworking. This is a forcing factor. We'll come out of it better and stronger. Um, so I'm optimistic as well. Okay. Judy's never been a pessimist, but I'll give her a chance to. Uh... <laughs> it's it's outside of my character, Bob. I'm always an optimist, yeah. and I would say that um, what we have here is an opportunity to change the way we work. We've already started. We're going to keep going. The one thing we haven't mentioned are contracts. I think, uh, you know, I think about all the work that uh, the acquisition community had to take on when COVID, when the CARES Act came out, and if we could anticipate. In the kinds of clauses that need to be in contracts to prevent that from happening, I think um, they deserve it. Okay. Well, listen, I can't thank you enough. This has been a great panel. I have a well, you, two pages you. of questions that I wanted. To, uh, you were you're lucky you got off the hook. You must have known. <laughs> yes. So but thanks to thanks to all of you and uh, continue. You know, best best wishes, best luck as you, as you work your way through this. And thanks for taking care of the most valuable part of the IC. And that's our people. Thank you. We're done. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Great conversation. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you to all of our panelists for a terrific discussion on a critical issue that will continue to evolve for some time to come. This concludes today's formal program. The summit will reconvene tomorrow at 1 o'clock when we will hold our plenary session on military service intelligence priorities. This discussion will feature all six services intelligence directors to include the newest military service, the U.S. Space Force. Once again, thank you to all of our sponsors for their support.
please take time to visit the virtual exhibit hall, where you can explore more than 50 virtual kiosks to learn more about the innovative services and technologies being applied in the DOD and the IC. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Stay safe, stay sane, and stay healthy. See you tomorrow.